today. Good. I'm Audrey Dubin, here for the GIC talk team. Before we start, please either turn off your cell phones or switch them to silent mode. Also, before we further move on to today's talk, I would like to briefly, infor briefly inform you about one of GIC's current projects. The GIC has been engaged in a campaign to raise awareness about recycling. Thus, we would like, you to, like to ask you to consider a reusable mug or other container for your drinks instead of using a disposable paper or plastic cup. Moreover, please separate your garbage and use the recycling bins at the entrance of the building. Now, shall we move on to today's talk? Yeah. Okay. Right. Today, Dr. Grochen of the United States is going to give us a talk entitled, Why Poetry? Are you ready to meet today's speaker? Yes. yes! Then let's please welcome him with a big round of applause. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for coming to today's talk. Uh, I'm going to stand over here so you can see this. Uh, why poetry? Uh, why did I choose that as the title of my talk? Well, uh, I know a lot about it because I've been studying it for many, many years. Uh, and uh, why am I studying it? Because I love to read poetry. Uh, I love to think about poetry. Um, but why do people write poetry? Why would I want to read poetry? I'll, I've been reading it since I was, well, uh, since as long as I could read, I think I've been reading poetry. Um, and so, uh, instead of answering directly the question, why poetry, I'm going to first look uh, and a little bit of what is poetry? Because if we look at what poetry is, although there are many more definitions than this, these are a few, that begins to answer the question, why read it? Why write it? Why study it? Why enjoy it? Uh, but uh, poetry, I don't think, oh, there we go. Poetry is the art of language. This is my definition of words assembled in powerful ways. Uh, and I know uh, people think about poetry in a lot of different ways. If my definition does not fit your definition, that's fine. You can tell me what yours is later, but now it's my turn. Uh, so, and, and this is uh, how Rita Dow defined poetry. Rita Dow, she's a famous poet in America. She was the national poet of the United States for several years, the Poet Laureate of the United States. Very well, uh, also an old, like me, lived in both Ohio and Virginia at different times in her life. Um, or here's another different, but language at its most distilled and most powerful, distilled the most, the words that have the most meaning in them. Right? It's, it's the art of language. Uh, and here, you, you all know Degas, he's a famous French uh, painter, uh, uh, and he was discussing poetry with Mallarmé, who was a French, <coughs> French poet. Degas said he had been trying and trying to write a poem, a sonnet, I think. Uh, <laughs> we're studying sonnets right now. Uh, but he just could not do it. And Degas said, it isn't ideas I am short of. I've got too many. I've lots of ideas. Uh, and said Degas, I'm not going to read the French for you. But Degas, replied Mallarmé, you can't make a poem with ideas, you make it with words. Those are the things that poems are made of. And that's interesting when he's talking to a painter, right? Because a painter cannot make a painting with an idea, right? He can't make it with a picture in his mind. He needs paint. And he needs brushes. He needs those things that you use to make a painting. And that's and and uh, people who know a lot about painting will examine the structure of a painting, the brush strokes. I, I can't do that. Uh, and so uh, for a poet, uh, uh, his words are like like uh, what paint is to a painter. I think. Um, and uh, let me take a look. Here. Uh, his words. Uh, and of course, everything is made with words, uh, or from the word. Uh, and so here's my religious reason for reading poetry, because in the beginning was 
The Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. That's my argument for poetry as the highest art form, the most <coughs> spiritual and religious of art form. Um, and he says the same, the Word was in the beginning with what? With God. So, I have a little cloth, so I need to... <laughs> Um, with, uh, all things were made by him. By him who? The Word. And without him was not anything made that was made. Uh, I think I won't. Oh. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And of course here they're talking about Jesus. But I'm using this as metaphor. For the divine power of poetry. Um, oh, this is... When, when anyone asks what's my favorite Bible passage, I always, I always say this, because I'm an English professor. <laughs> I teach poetry. <clears throat> okay, so, um, poet, the word is, is, is how we create the world in some ways, even in our own minds. Without language, we don't know anything, right? We need to be able to put it into words. And... Uh, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, the famous American critic, transcendentalist, he said, of language, he said, all language is fossil poetry. Everything we say was a poem at one point. Because we saw a rock, we called it rock. And that rock is metaphor. The sound of the word maybe sounds like rock to us. But the, the, it didn't have a name until some poet named it. Um, oh. Uh, and and uh, so now I want to jump back to the beginning. Uh, whoops. Again. Whoops. Uh, so, um, if God is the Word, uh, and we are, as it says here, so God created, well, I'm, I'm pushing the wrong button there. So God created mankind, and he means humanity, men and women, not just men, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Uh, so God created us in his image. I promise this is not a religious talk. Not entirely, a little bit. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a, a, a development of the idea of creativity. Um, so if uh, God created mankind in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, and he was God, and we are created in God's image, we are the Word too, or the words. God might be the Word, but we're the words. Uh, and what, is, what does the Word do? He creates. Uh, and that's poetry. The creative art of the Word, of language. Uh, okay. Uh, now, what, why poetry? Why read poetry? Uh, you know, a lot of poets have told us why they think we should read poetry. And this is from William Carlos Williams, a famous... Uh, American poet who lived in the early uh, to, to late 20th century, was born in the 1880s and died in the 1960s. Um, here's what he says about poems. It is difficult, right here, it is difficult to get the news from poems. You have to turn on YTM. <laughs> Yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there or lack of what is found in poetry. This is how important he thought poetry was. He said, whatever you find in poetry, if that's missing, <coughs> men die every day. And they die miserably because it's missing. Now, he doesn't say that it's men die miserably because they don't read poetry. He doesn't <laughs> say that. But what he says is poetry is one of the places you can look for life, right? Look for those things that are valuable in life. Those things that if we don't have them, people die. And that can be all sorts of things. A lot of human compassion, love, right? beauty, uh, understanding. Uh, oh, uh, here's, here's, I think, an example of, even, of what we can find in this poem. Uh, or let me put it this way. What can we find in this poem that if we didn't have, people would die? We can find people dying, certainly. Uh, this is a poem from World War II called... Uh, I keep 
There, that's what I mean. The theory of aerial bombardment. Air, planes dropping bombs. This is a famous poem. You would think, he says, the theory of aerial bombardment would rouse God, awaken God, to relent, to stop uh, inflicting pain. And what, it, what you see in here, I think, is, uh, I won't read the whole poem, but here is a, an engagement with the world, things of the world, in language. Uh, you would think the theory of aerial bombardment would rouse God to relent. I just saw Noah last night. Anybody see Noah? Yeah. Noah, the movie. Noah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of thinking, well, you think something would cause God to relent, but nothing seems to. Be. Um, in any case, uh, uh, and, and in here you find this sympathy for other certainly you find uh, the reason that people die miserably every day aerial bombardment if you drop a bomb on people they often die um, and uh, he says again you would feel that after so many centuries God would give man to repent he would make us stop doing that uh, and of course He's writing about people dying, but what we find in here, in this poem, is that human connection that asks us, why do we kill each other without, with so much abandon, right? Why do we do that? Now, uh, without, lots of people die because we don't have that human compassion every day. And you can find that compassion in philosophy, and you can find it in religion, but you can also find it in poetry. Um, uh, and here's, uh, and poems are, are historical things too. They come from history. Poets talk to each other, talk back to history. As we can see uh, in this poem, oh, I got the right button. The American poet, uh, oh, this is by the poet Robert Haas. Like Rita Dow, he was also, um, he was also the poet laureate of the United States, the national poem. Uh, you can I'll tell you what that is more than. But uh, and he refers. He gets it wrong. This is a misquotation. But that's okay. You would think God would relent. The American poet Richard Eberhardt wrote during World War II, listening to the theory of aerial bombardment. Uh, notice he titles this a poem. It doesn't really look like a poem. Because it's all one big solid block. Uh, and there are complicated reasons he does that. But uh, I'm, I'm looking at the human connection rather than the structural connection. I just want to read this and think about all uh, the, 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 the human compassion we see here. The lack of which cause, causes people to die miserably every day. These are war poems. It's easy to see in war poems. But let's... The American, okay, listen, of course, well, for crying out loud, there, here it is. Uh, of course, God is not the cause of aerial bombardment. During the Vietnam War, the United States hired the Rand Corporation to conduct a study of the effects in the peasant villages of Vietnam of their policy of saturation bombing of the countryside. That policy had at least two purposes, to defoliate the tropical forests as a way of locating the enemy and to kill the enemy if it happened to be in the way of the concussion bombs or the napalm or the fire bombs. The Rand Corporation sent a young scholar named, <laughs> the complicity of scholars and, 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 and uh, 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 mil the military, sent a young scholar named Leon Gore, I don't know if that's how to pronounce it, to Vietnam. His study was rushed by the Air Force and was imp who was, which was impatient for results, but he was able to conduct interviews through interpreters with farmers in the Mekong Delta and the mountainous hillside farm regions around Hue. And, uh, he concluded that the incidental damage to civilian lives was very considerable. Notice the cold language. Incidental damage to civilian lives. They're not even people, they're just civilian lives. Uh, was very, uh, was very con considerable in that the villagers were angry and afraid. Well, you think? Angry and afraid. But he also found that they blamed, I love this where I cut it, who did they blame? Not the Americans. That's, what, that's what's weird. The Viet Cong, the insurrectionist army uh, the U.S. was fighting, and not the United States for their troubles. 
because they thought of the Viet Cong as their legitimate government and felt it wasn't protecting them. See, uh, now, uh, if we think about the manipulation of language, if we look here, they blamed, I think they blame America. Um, but he waits until the next line, the way he forms it, to give us the answer, this surprise in the language. Because the language, I would expect, is they blamed the United States. But that's not what we get. Um, the Viet Cong, okay. And not the United States for their troubles, because they thought of the Viet Cong as their legitimate government and felt it wasn't protecting them. Uh, seeing that the bombing was alienating the peasantry from the enemy Vietnamese, Robert, Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, General William Westmoreland, the commander in charge of the prosecuting, prosecuting the war, and Lyndon Johnson, the President of the United States, ordered an intensification of the bombing, which will kill intensification of the bombing, translate as the murder of many more innocent civilians. Um, Douglas, you like this poem, don't you? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, in the end, or the content, anyway. In the end, there were more bombs dropped on the villages and forests of South Vietnam than were dropped in all of World War II. I didn't know that until I read this poem. There were more uh, bombs dropped on the villages and forests of South Vietnam than were dropped in all of World War II. Wow. Uh, the, estimated, uh, the estimated Vietnamese casualties during the war uh, is 2 million, and it was a war whose principal strategy was, there's the use of language that, for powerful reasons, was terror. More Iraqi civilians, oops, he just jumped from one war to another uh, uh, in a surprise turn of the language, maybe not so surprising. More Iraqi civilians have now been incidental casualties of the conduct of the war in Iraq than were killed by Arab terrorists in the destruction of the World Trade Center. In the first 20 years, I didn't know this, and it's a powerful use of language, it's just bureaucratic, descriptive, encyclopedia-like language that in this context takes on a very powerful effect when it's constructed as a poem. Uh, so, in the first 20 years of the 20th century, 90% of war deaths were the deaths of combatants, soldiers, who named them, right? In the last 20 years of the 20th century, 90% of war deaths were the deaths of civilians. The poem's almost over. Turn the page. There are imaginable responses to these facts. Notice he, 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 he mentions the imagination. We can imagine responses. What are some of these we can imagine? But what he's also telling us is these are imaginary responses. Only imagine, because these are not the responses that the responsible parties have taken. The nations of the world could stop setting an example for suicide bombers. They could abolish the use of landmines. They could abolish the use of aerial bombardment in warfare. And here is the very powerful use of language, and language in its historical context, referring back to Richard Eberhardt. You would think God would relent. Robert Haas puts the blame where it lies. You would think men would relent. And that's a powerful use of language. And that's a poem uh, that uh, the, the sympathies for which, if they are lacking, lead to people miserably dying every day. Uh, to me, poetry is important. This is what I thought. Now, you can find this in other places. You don't you can find it in philosophy, right? But uh, you can find it in poetry. Uh, now, not everyone thinks that poetry is that important. Here's a man who's lying. Anybody know this one? For poetry makes nothing happen. This is what he says. <laughs> poetry makes nothing happen. There's Robert Haas trying to move our hearts, right? And here's W.H. Auden uh, in, in, uh, in memory of W.B. Yeats. Poetry makes nothing happen. It survives in the valley of its making where executives would never want to tamper. Exe CEOs of companies would never want to bother with poetry. And what he's saying, of course, and I guess he's right, that in the world of busyness, busyness, business, in the world of the military, in the world, poetry does nothing. It has no effect. But of course, what he realizes it does, 
survive in the valley of its making. It has an effect on us when we read it. And if it affects us, we, this is what I think as a teacher of poetry, if it affects us, if it affects my students, they might be able to affect the world. My teaching is always political in that sense, even when it's not obviously political. Um, uh, I, and from poetry, I want my students to get a, a love of words, a love of language, a, a, an appreciation for the beauty and the art, and sometimes the ugliness of the art of poetry. And second, I want them to learn <coughs> human connection. I want them to be part of the people who, who uh, try to end uh, the governments giving examples to terrorists. Okay. Oh, oh, here's a famous, I like this one. Can you see? This is a famous American poet, Marianne Moore. What's her reaction? Well, William Carlos Williams says, uh, if, you, if you don't read that, that in poetry, you find things the lack of which men die miserably for every day or something like that. She says, this is, the title of this poem is Poetry. She says, I too dislike it. She's a poet. I too dislike it. And a lot, maybe some people. There are things, there are things that are more important uh, beyond all this fiddle. Fiddle is just playing around like on your fiddle dancing. Um, that's what she says about, there are things, whoops, wrong again, uh, that are important beyond all this fiddle. I, I'm going to tell you, you need to, you need to get a clock. This is a new room, you haven't figured everything, you need to have a clock right up there yeah. for people like me. Because um, I know I'm going to um, Why don't you give me one? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll go get one. Uh, well, the, the little red thing is on the bottom. Uh, reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers in it, after all, a place for the genuine, the real, the true, right? True beauty, false beauty. <laughs> this is for a couple of students here. So to remember the lecture from yesterday. Here's what Emily Dickinson, another poet, one of the best poets the world has ever produced. Here's what she says about poetry. If I read a book and it makes my whole body so cold, no cover, or if I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry. <laughs> Her mind is blown uh, before that. Okay, or Robert Frost. This is a wonderful one. Uh, and he writes about, he says, poetry has some wildness in it. We talk about wildness in a second. Um, but he says, it gives a momentary stay against confusion. That's one thing poetry can do for us. The world is a confusing place. We can look at a poetry and withdraw from the world. There was Robert Haas engaging in the world, right? The war in the world. He says, we can find a stay, a, a still place. A place of move, uh, uh, without movement, a place to pause from the confusion of the world. Uh, and that's one thing poetry can do. Again, that's another thing, uh, and, and can for me, religion can do too. But poetry can help us stay against the confusion. Because the world is always confusing. It's always confusing. And, and, and that's not, uh, we'll never have all the answers. And every once in a while, we want to pause, we want to rest. You don't want to think about the confusion. And a nice little poem can give us that moment of peace, of meditation, of wonder. <laughs> like Emily, uh, I get, oh, uh, I says, uh, picking up on, uh, or giving the ground for Robert Frost's wildness, she says, a little madness, craziness. It's good. A little madness, in, and I like it because yesterday was the first day of spring, was it not? A little madness in the spring is wholesome, even for the king. But God be with the clown. The clown is, I mean, he's not an important person at all. God be with the clown, the clown who ponders this tremendous scene. This whole experiment of green. That's the world. This whole experiment of green. It's the springtime world. Everything's coming up green. As if it were his own. And this is a, one of her pictures of the poet, or the lover of poetry, uh, someone who can ponder, think about, 
this tremendous scene, this world, this whole experiment, as if it were his own. In the imagination, the poet owns the world, right? owns everything he or she sees. In his and she takes this actually from Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau, this idea of it's in imagination where we really own things, not on paper. Okay, I'm how far? I'm one quarter of the way into my talk, and and three quarters of the way done with my time. So wait, I'm going to skip a few slides. Now, this always happens. Um, but uh, I could do part two next. No, it goes. Okay. Oh, here's what Schlossky <coughs> says about poetry or literature. What it does, he calls it estrangement, defamiliarization. He takes what is familiar, this is what a poet does, what is familiar, what we know really well, and he dees it. He makes it unfamiliar. He makes us see it again. See it as if it's new, as if we've never seen it before. Something we've seen a thousand times. This is what Robert Browning says in, about painting, but he means it about poetry as well. He said, we love first <clears throat> when we see them painted, things we have passed, perhaps a hundred times, nor cared to see. We didn't even look at them. And then they put it in a painting or in a poem, and then we see them, right? the things we never noticed. And so they are better painted or better put in a poem. Um, oh, here's one. <clears throat> I'm talking about the clever use of language. This is Metaphors by Sylvia Plath. Metaphors, unyu. <laughs> uh, and, and the poem is, it's a fun poem, a riddle, but it shows how important words are. Uh, it says, I'm a riddle in nine syllables. Okay, first part of the little riddle, nine syllables. If we count each line, each line has nine syllables. I'm a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Each line has nine syllables. You know how many lines there are? Nine. nine. Okay. What's the answer to this riddle? I'm a riddle in nine syllables. An elephant. A big thing. A ponderous, ponderous means heavy and weighty. Ponderous house. That's what I am. I'm a melon. Subak. Uh, <laughs> Strolling on two tendrils, skinny legs. Uh, oh, red fruit, right? Red fruit, that's the melon. Ivory, the elephant. Fine timbers, the house. This loaf, now we're on bread. A loaf of bread is big with its yeasty rising. Money is new minted, brand new money, in this fat purse. I'm a means. A stage, a couch in calf. I've eaten a bag of green apples. If you eat a bag of green apples, by the way, you get sick. They're just green and acidic. It could make you sick and you would throw up, especially if you say, ate them in the morning. Uh, boarded the train, there's no getting off. Board got gotten on the train and now I can't get off. What is this a riddle for? Anybody? <laughs> Okay, you go look it up on the internet. No, it's, it's, a, it's a riddle for a pregnant woman. Uh, yeah, nine syllables, nine lines. Look at the pictures. Uh, and I usually, I love to teach this poem. And, and when I teach the poem, I say, okay, when you get it, you can't tell anybody what the answer is. You just have to help by asking questions. But see, an elephant, a pregnant woman, feels like an elephant, right? Uh, a ponderous house, something lives inside a house, right? And this one is a vision, a melon, strolling on two skinny legs, yeah? Oh, red fruit, ivory fine timbers. A loaf of bread is big with its yeasty rot. Can anybody see me do this? Uh, money's new money in this fat purse. Right? All these are images, and, that, and children are valuable things, right? Uh, I'm a means, a stage, a cow and calf. A cow and calf means a pregnant cow. I'm just a, a means to something else. And I've eaten a bag of green apples, that's why I said that one might make you sick. 
especially if you eat it in the morning. That's what I said. <laughs> Aborted the train, there's no getting off. As we say in America, you cannot be a little bit pregnant, right? Once you're on that train, uh, you, you, well, these days you can't, of course, medically. But it takes, if you let it go to term, it takes nine months to get on that train. You don't get off that train until you get to the destination, right? Of course, with abortion and things, you can't. But this was before Roe v. Wade. Before the abortion was legal in America. Okay, or just the taste of language. This one's about words. To a poor old woman. And I want to show you what he does. And then I'm going to rip right to the end of it and miss half this presentation. Um, this is a, he's writing to a poor old woman. Um, and he just uses, all he does is use the place where he breaks the lines, where he stops, creates a pause to make us taste with this woman, those plums, munching a plum, and not a Korean plum, but you know, a, a, one of, a juicy plum, because you eat a plum, it just runs down here. Mm, nothing like a plum. Uh, to a poor old woman, munching a plum on a, oh no, I better look at it. Munching a plum on the street, a paper bag of them in her hand. They taste good to her. They taste good. They taste good to her. And see, just where he makes those lines break, we're tasting all the different flavors of the few little words he said. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. And he creates different rhythms in the language. And he says, ah, well, you can find that. Okay. Ah. This is what about invention. I'm going to ask you this. This is another Emily Dickinson poem. Four lines, that's all. Faith is a fine invention for gentlemen who see, but microscopes are prudent in an emergency. How many inventions are in the poem? Very good. Microscopes and faith. Which is the best invention for her? Microscopes, you see. A close observation of the world is better than faith. But she's not, she's talking about a particular kind of faith, the kind that gentlemen have. The Cezanne no pinsara, right? The high people in the world. People who haven't, and they see, you know, gen, those gentlemen understand everything. But she's talking about a different kind of faith, the trust in the world. And of course, God is the one that made us creative that gave us the ability to build microscopes, to examine the world, this experiment of green that he gave us. Okay, oh, what's this one? Eh, eh, eh. Oh, we'll skip this one. Oh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about where my poetry comes from. And that's what I, and these are a couple of the, two of the poems that I loved when I was a little boy. I read them in the best loved poems of the American people. A book full of bad poetry. And very, some, some good poetry, huh? but it's all very rhythmic and bouncy. It doesn't mean very much. Uh, uh, it's not doesn't have much depth of thought. But this is one I love. And, and you can just, and it's, the, it's the sort of concrete rhythm of the poems, like of music that captured me when I was young, uh, I think. Uh, and also the, the, the easy sentiment, the easy feeling. And, and this one, because it was by the lake, by my hometown, about the lake by my state where I grew up. By the shores of Gitche Gumi, by the shining big sea water, stood the wigwam of Nokomis, daughter, oh, I can't do that, daughter of the moon. Nokomis, dark behind it, rose the forest, rose the black and the gloomy pine trees, rose the firs with cones upon them. I don't care what, she, what he's saying, <laughs> what he's writing, I'm, I'm starting to feel the... The rhythm of it. And, and people have argued this because that rhythm is innate to us. And that gets back to the Sylvia Plath poem. A bad metaphor. Because for nine months, we all ride in our mother's wombs. Well, most of us nine months. It varies. And, and for those nine months, we have a heartbeat. Boom, 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 boom. Creating rhythm in us. That rhythm is natural. A lot of people have argued this about poetry. Um, or here's another one. A little bit better, but... It was many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. 
Okay. Uh, this is a man who said the most beautiful uh, thing in the world is the death of a beautiful woman. The most poetic thing in the world is a death of a beautiful. And this is about the death of a beautiful woman. Uh, but I'm not going to. But it has a rhythm that captures me as a young man. And and but those and this is a a, a more fun one with a rhythm by Wallace Stevens, Chief Chieftain. Notice if you can I F. Y O U C A N. How's to Isumyan? If you can, of as can, A S C A N. Okay. Chieftain, if you can, of as can, and caftan of tan with henna hat with hall. <laughs> Damn the universe of cock, as if the sun was blackamoor to bear your blazing tail. Fat, 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 fat. I am the personal. Your world is you. I. Whatever that means. You ten foot poet among inchlings, fat, be gone. And inch, it's a little worm, by the way. And inchling bristles in these pines, bristles and points their Appalachian tangs, and fears not portly as can nor whose foods. The world is, oh, that's okay. But this is where my rhythms came from. They came maybe from the Korah that I heard from my mother, but I grew up in the church. And I grew up in the church with the King James Version of the Bible. And every Sunday I had to memorize one passage from the Old Testament and one passage from the New Testament. And I hated it. I hated every minute of it. But it was ingrained in my, in my heart, in the rhythms of my heart. Right? Because this comes from the King James Version. Uh, and th this is because it, uh, King James I was the first. In any case, you got literary people, poets, to translate the Bible. And, 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 and this is from the Psalms, which are songs. And this is a, a, not a regular rhythm, but there's a rhythm here. And this is the one uh, where I think for many Americans who grew up in the church, this is one of the poems, the rhythms that sort of, uh, of the repetitions. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I learned how to read poetry going to church. Um, and part of it is because, in, well, I'm not going to explain all that. Anymore. But it, it, uh, a church is full of language and beautiful music and rhythms. It doesn't matter whether you believe or not, church is still full of that stuff. Um, oh, how are we doing? Okay, a couple more minutes. I'll go. Um, this is, I just want, sometimes poetry is really hard. I'm just, uh, no, I'm going to skip this one. Oh, yeah, it's like what Jimmy Dugan said to Dottie Hinson when she complained that it, it just got too hard. Jimmy Dugan said, it's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. What's Jimmy Dugan talking about, by the way? Anybody? Baseball. Baseball. This is from a league of their own. Um, with Dottie Hinson is, is Gina Davis, right? Dottie Hinson is Gina Davis, Jimmy Dugan is Tom Hanks. He's talking about baseball. Uh, but baseball is poetry, as Marianne Morton. Um, oh, I'm not going to talk about this one. Uh, because, well, I will talk for a minute. The Road Not Taken. This is the poem we hear at high school graduations every spring in America, telling every person, you are special, you're special, you're special, you're special. You are going to follow the road less traveled, right? Are we all going to follow the road less traveled? Because if we all follow the road less traveled, it becomes a highway. Right? It is no longer, and, and so, and so uh, in fact, Robert Frost is mocking those people who think everybody's going to travel. He's a mean and vicious man, Robert Frost. He wasn't, 
wasn't a kind and gentle man. So this speaker here, see, listen to him. Uh, in fact, uh, two roads diverge in a yellow wood. And sorry, I could not travel both. Right? We go, in our lives, we come to, well, we can't travel both roads. We've got to take one way or the other. And be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, okay, as just as fair. And having perhaps a better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. And then he, at the end he says, oh, I shall be telling this with a sigh. Age, somewhere ages and ages. He's of somebody who thinks ages and years and years in the future. Everybody's going to care which road he took, right? I'm, I'll be really important. Everybody's going to want to know what I did. Right? He's the personal. Um, and I, I took the one less traveled by. That's what he says. That's his idea. And that has made all the difference. How much less traveled was it? Go so as far from there and warn them really about the same. In other words, he just takes, takes one of the roles. He doesn't make a choice, really. He's sort of a choice. I've got to take a role. Because um, here's what Robert Frost is saying. What does the real individual do? What does he do? Does he follow a road? No. He's an American. He's a pioneer. He goes out through the woods. He makes his own road. And, if, and, if you, and so he's mocking all the people who think, oh, I'm going on my own road, when they just follow the same path that everybody else has taken. But this is used at graduations over and over again. People get sentimental about it. And <laughs> Robert Frost was not a sentimental man. That's no meaning. Um, and this is about the, 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 the work of not just poetry, but actually a tree and dancing. He's comparing poetry to dance. This is W.B. Yeats. Labor, hard work. That's what makes a poet, hard work. Uh, now, John Keats said, if, if poetry does not come as easy as leaves to a tree, it had better not come at all. He was lying. He was lying. Good poetry is a, is, is, is a, 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 a hard work. Uh, and also, by the word labor, of course, a, when, when someone gives birth, they go into labor. But he says, labor is blossoming or dancing where the body is not bruised to pleasure soul. And usually when we write poetry, the body is bruised to pleasure soul. We stay up late at night and our body gets old and tired. We have to work hard. Uh, art damages us when we make it. But when we read it, there's no, we don't see the damage. We just see the beauty, right? Um, uh, nor beauty born out of its own despair, nor blear-eyed wisdom out of midnight oil. O oh, chestnut tree, O oh, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? And here's the line to the O oh, body swaying to music, O oh, brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? And he's asking, how can we separate the person from the art, from the poetry? Um, and it's just beautiful. That's why I want to say it. But, you know, poetry is not just a removal into art. It's a turn to the world. Although here in this poem, this is the last, second to last slide. Here in this poem, W.B. Yeats <coughs> titles it Politics. Um, and as in, as, uh, you know, Robert Haas titled his poem about politics, a poem, poem, a poem, right? But it was about politics. And so this is just, he's, he's an old man now. It's just before World War II. The world is going to be uh, destroyed well, or caught up in this huge war, right? Millions and millions of people will die until the Vietnam War when they pop, drop more bombs than they <laughs> dropped during all World War II. And, and here's the old man who uses poetry and turns back to life, away from death. How can I, that girl standing there, or there, or there, or there. My attention fix on Roman, or on Russian, or on Spanish politics. Right? Fascists, fascists, communists, World War II. <laughs> on, on Roman, or on Russian, or on Spanish <coughs> politics. Yet, here's a traveled man that knows what he talks about. And there's a politician that has read and thought, and maybe what they say is true of war and war's alarms. 
but oh, that I were young again and held her in my arms. I love that. Because it turns back to life, right? That focus on death. But then he says, he's an old man, much older than I am. And I'm kind of an old man. But oh, that I were young again and held her in my arms. And it's that love of life, that embrace of beauty again in the world that he, that he finishes this poem on. And this is the last poem that he put in his collected works. This is his last, this is how I finish it, he said. This is my life in poetry, and this is the poem. It's the last lyrical poem that I put in it. But oh, that I were young and healthy. I get choked up every time I read it because it's passion that comes up. And that's why I read poetry. That's the end. <laughs>